by acknowledging that VIPs drive casino success, right? That's not really a big surprise. What is a little bit of a surprise is how reliant we are in the casino world on just a handful or just a small group of very significant players, right? The reason that we're all um, aware of, knowledgeable about the 80-20 rule, the fact that 20% of your customers generate 80% of the business, is because that's pretty widely applicable to lots of industries, lots of businesses. In the casino world though, it's actually, we're more skewed than that, right? I wasn't sure, and I ran some numbers, I'm curious before I show the next slide, whether there's other people, perhaps at your own casino, who have thought about this and maybe run some numbers. Anybody like do an 80X split? Okay. So in this, Graph. This was the analysis that we did at one particular casino, right? We looked at their results for the last four years, 2015 through 18. And we measured their slot business separate from the table business. We measured their Theo, and we measured the actual revenue. And what we found was the lighter um, line is the 80% threshold. It only took, I'm gonna focus on slot Theo in the upper left. It only took about 8% of their players to generate 80% of the business. So not 80-20, more like 88. And only about 15% to generate 90% of the business, right? So think about the complement to that for a second, meaning if 90% of your business is generating, or 90% of your uh, business is coming from 15% of your customers, that means the other 85% of your customers are responsible for only 10% of your overall slot data, okay? You see a little bit of a spike in 2018. That's mostly because we ran this in the middle of 2018. So um, we didn't have the full complement of new card signups and some infrequent guests. So if we had run this at the end of 2018, it'd probably be flat as well. And you can see, it is pretty flat with table Theo, um, and the actuals are even lower. You even see like the extreme here, table actual in the last two years, 17 and 18, 90% of their actual table revenue is coming from just barely 5% of their customer base. So it does beg the question a little bit about, as a marketer, are you, dividing your time proportionally, right? If they're so important to your overall revenue, are you actually spending enough time thinking about marketing plans and um, promotions that work specifically for the VIP guests, right? Here's the same data, just a little bit differently, right? In this case, we divided the entire database into deciles, 10 groups, according to their Theo contribution. The bar on the left represents the top 10%, and they generate well over 80% of the overall FIA in both slots and tables, right? Even in 2018, it's just barely uh, 80%, even when we didn't have the full year. But it's easy to see how much they dominate compared to the other 90% of your customers, right? So again, there's the 80-20 rule, and then there's this like, our business, which is just way more proportional, way more skewed. So that's a big responsibility for you as marketers, right? If the VIP business is so crucial to the health of your business, then it's obviously essential that you make sure that your VIP players are loyal to you and stay loyal to you. But it's tough because these are the same players that your competitors want as well, local and in destination markets like Las Vegas where they can out amenity a small regional operator, even a big regional operator, right? So that's your challenge, is to keep these people loyal while they're being pulled away by your competitors. One error, or one possible 
area of complacency is to look at these graphs and see some, the, the graphs being generally pretty flat from year to year, and assume that that means, well, okay, once we have a VIP player, clearly we're doing a good job in this case of keeping them, because otherwise we'd see all kinds of volatility. These numbers would be bouncing up and down every year, right? So yeah, it's tough to get a new VIP player, develop one, but once we have one, it seems like, okay, we're doing a pretty good job of maintaining that, right? That's a complacency I want you to uh, be aware of because this is a 30,000 foot overview, right? This is looking at your entire database over the course of a year. We get out of microscope and we start looking at individual players, we're gonna find that there's actually a ton of volatility, right? Individually, people are always having bursts of activity, planning up, playing down, pulling back, showing up a lot, responding to your marketing offers, not, all that kind of stuff. So again, don't think that because the aggregate numbers are consistent, that the individual players are consistent. So this challenge that I mentioned is crucial because people are constantly moving in and out, up and down. Stability is an illusion, that's what I'm saying. The last point is the one that's key here, right? No matter what, even if your casino is growing, and I'm gonna assume that right now most casinos are generally growing for the last couple years, there's always gonna be a group of VIP players whose contribution is declining. So we ran some numbers at a couple of casinos to try to quantify this. So this is sort of some aggregate data at a couple of casinos. Among the top 10%, that group that we saw in that graph that was completely dominating the overall FIO contribution, the next, we looked at their contribution the next year, 38% of them fell out of the top 10%, right? So that's your churn rate, turnover. That's a pretty good number, more than a third. Over half of them reduced their FIO contribution the next year by at least 25%. That was a surprise to me. I figured, okay, they can go up, they can go down, but a lot of the down might just be five or 10%. To see half falling by 25%, okay, that was a little eye-opening. The last point was the most scary, I guess. 40% of people who are your top 10%, the next year they reduce their FIO contribution by half or more, right? So you're talking about a player who generates $1,000 FIO a month, that's 12,000 a year. The next year, less than 6,000, right? So that's one person, $6,000 drop from year to year. How about your, you know, players who really give you something, $30,000 a year perhaps. That's falling to minimum of 15,000, maybe even a loss of 30,000 from year to year, right? So that's a lot of money by individual players. And that's sort of the opportunity that we want to be aware of and try to scoop back up. So here's a graph that represents, I'm gonna show you how that volatility works, right? So this graph represents the top 1% of a particular casino. Each dot is one player. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, represents the number of days they showed up at this casino, all the way up to 365. And the y-axis is their average daily fee. And a technical note, you'll note that it's a logarithmic graph, so it goes real quickly from 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. So just a small change vertically is a big change in dollars. But you can see the um, curve that it took to be among the top 1%, right? You either had to show up a whole lot or play a whole lot per visit and still show up reasonably often. Um, and you see some like real elites who are beyond that minimum curve. Normally I like to talk about the top 10%, but we'd have, it would overwhelm this particular graph. You'd have 10 times as many dots. So I've talked about volatility. I've talked about a lack of stability. I've, talk, I've showed some numbers that say lots of players are gonna fall. So I'm hoping that you can have a pretty good idea of what the next chart looks like.
when we show what happened to these players the next year, right? Here it is. Okay, way more chaotic. Doesn't not nice and neat like the previous one. We categorize each player into one of three categories, right? The green represents people who grew from when you're a significant amount from the first year to the next, right? So these people are already among your top 1% players and they grew the next year, right? So these are our favorite people, right? These are people who love you. The yellow dots, and it's a little tough to see on this um, screen here, I apologize, but the yellow dots represent people who were pretty steady, right? So they were in the 1%, and they pretty much stayed there the next year. So again, very thankful for these people, generating a ton of um, revenue for you. And I'm, before I continue, I also want to say that this, the green and the yellow validate your um, marketing efforts, right? These are people who are responding to your offers, to your promos, to your events. Uh, everything that you're doing is working with these people. Their business is growing and you know it's all good and they're among your elite, so terrific. So none of this that I'm talking about today is a uh, criticism or a challenge of anyone's existing uh, marketing uh, processes or, or campaigns or anything like that. The group that we're concerned with is the red dots, right? These are people who decline by 40% from one year to the next, right? And you see they're like bunched up on the left, fewer visits. A lot of them are down, less spend per visit, right? So again, you had successful marketing campaigns. You have the green and the yellow people who are uh, demonstrating a positive response to what you're doing. But for whatever reason, and we don't know why yet because we haven't looked into it, but we know that there's some people who aren't responding, right? For whatever reason. And that sort of creating a plan B to try to recapture those people, that's the opportunity that we're talking about. So how big of an opportunity is this? Let's assume a casino that does $100 million in revenue a year, right? So you can scale this up and down in your head based on your own casino's annual revenue. The VIP business, about 85% of that. 40% of those players are gonna decline by 40% or more. I think I said 50 a couple slides ago, we're gonna be conservative. So real quick, the 85 million times 40% of players times 40% decline, that's 13 and a half million dollars. Just walk out the door from one year to the next, okay? That's a minimum, right? That would be if, if exactly, if the players all dropped by exactly 40%, right? But realistically, players drop by 60%. Players drop by 80%. Some even drop, unfortunately, by 100%. So as we've done this analysis a couple times now, realistically, you're talking about 20 to 25% of the total casino revenue in play by these VIP decliners. That's a lot, right? Now, I'm not gonna suggest that you have a chance of regaining all of that. I'm not saying there's a $20 million opportunity. I'm not even gonna say it's half, right? But you can, um, you know, if you dedicate yourself to it, and we'll get to a little bit about that, there is a chunk of this that you can recover, and that's really the key. Um, I wanna pause for a second. There might be some people thinking they're not, necessarily sure this $20 million seems like a crazy amount. You can say, hey, again, my casino's been growing lately. Even if I go back a couple years to when we slumped a little bit, we had declines of 4%, maybe 6 7%. We've never had a year where we fell by 20%, nothing like that. And of course, like I said, you got people who are growing simultaneously. You have new players coming in and some of them are developing into high-end players, right? So there's always like a backfill. There's always some people who are helping to generate growth. But these people, the decliners, also exist. And even in a healthy, growing casino, there's no reason to just let that opportunity sit there and not make an effort to go after it and to recover some of that revenue. I see it as a pretty clear opportunity, right? Reduce the number of VIP decliners, defectors, inactives, whatever you want to call them, 
you have a chance to recover a huge amount of play. And the best part is these are people that you know like your casino. They were just among your elites last year, maybe even just a few months ago, right? So there's a connection there. They probably have a good relationship with your employees for the most part. In some cases it could have eroded, in some cases it could be competition, in some cases it could be a single service breakdown. But the point is the relationship is there. And if you're gonna invest in developing players, I would think that players who you know can deliver are better than recruiting new players who you don't know how it's gonna turn out, right? How, of course, that's the question, that's what everyone wants to know. So before I continue, to get an idea here. How are we doing? Are we on board? Are people uh, seeing this opportunity, right? Does your data assume that there's no changes in the market? These are, I mean, real casino data, so there's obviously other competitors who are building assets who are obviously changing their marketing, so, I mean, <coughs> the change. At the properties that we looked at, in some in some cases, yes. Because if you jack up the whole percentage on your machines, which a lot of places do to try and create more revenue, that's going to impact the player that says, "I'm going to go here instead." Someone who's price sensitive, for sure. So exactly. I'm just asking, is it all things are equal here? Or? We we looked at a number of casinos. So put it this way: none of the data is weighted by a single major change like that. It's you know aggregated, average. You know, yeah. So I don't have all the answers, and there's certainly no magic bullet, I'm not gonna propose that, right? If you've been in the casino business for more than about 10 minutes, that you know that there's no magic bullets out there that can solve all your problems. But I do believe that you can focus on these players and really do a good job of starting to recover the revenue, right? But a couple steps. Number one is to find the players, right? And this goes back to my start where I said, as an analyst, I assumed that the host knew exactly who all their players were and knew their ups and downs and their, that's not the case, right? So you need dedicated analytics that are constantly crawling and searching your entire database and running numbers on everybody in there, right? With today's technology, that's actually pretty easy to do. Um, Average daily fee, that's the number everyone in marketing likes to consider, right? Think about, that's sort of the key metric, right? I don't really care about average daily fee. I'm looking at a long term, right? I wanna know how much monthly revenue you generate and compare that to your previous months or an average annual revenue and see how that's doing to see whether you're coming down or not. Um, whether you wanna spread it out over a few days or a single visit, that's not too big of a concern for me. Um, and early, right, that's key. Once a player has significantly dropped and, and had a pretty good gap of play since the last time they visited, you're really behind the eight ball at that point. The earlier you can get in there, just like any other you know, a health situation, the earlier that you can intervene and start to treat the situation, the better chance you have to cure it. You need to observe the players, right? So, if you're relying on your CMS to help you get a understanding of a player's gaming history, it's just not gonna really work out. That's, that's, that's something that I've seen over and over again that's very frustrating. The CMS is there, people assume that the CMS has all the data, so let me look through these text-based columns representing visits, and let me try to, in my mind, try to notice ups and downs and gaps in play and all that stuff, it's just impossible. You need a graphical view that like shows you in one snapshot, hey, here's burst of activity, here's where we played up, played down, all this kind of stuff. And you can see gaps and less frequent play, more frequent play. You need to focus on actual win and loss, right? Everyone loves to talk about Theo, but lots of times a player you know, went through a significant run of bad luck. So the Theo is mild, but their actual losses are significant. 
that's a natural reason for someone to maybe take a break, okay? And a lot of times, this goes back to the CMS, you know, using a fixed metric, 12 month uh, ADT or ADW or six month, you know, if someone has just had bad luck in the past six weeks, it's gonna take a long time for that to like show up and, and the CMS is gonna reflect all that stuff. So again, the CMS is not an analytical tool. You can't rely on that to provide you um, with insight on a player's history. Um, you wanna try to correlate uh, with marketing offers. So you can try to see if they match, hey, when we do this type of offer, this person shows up. When they do a different type of offer, they stay home. Um, it's not often that it's perfectly correlated, but sometimes you can get some insight by doing that. And the last thing is to try to do a little triage. <laughs> try to generate a hypothesis as to whether a player is moving to a competitor, in which case you know the gaming uh, play is still there, just not at your place, and you can try to win that back. Or if they you know, decline overall and like have reduced their play significantly, which might be a tougher to win them back. So a little bit of triage. Have that hypothesis. Number three is key, and that's deploying your hosts. These are your frontline soldiers, right? They have to build, if they don't already have it, a relationship with the player, right? The player is, we don't know the situation exactly, right? Could be an issue at home, could be an issue with your casino, could be something external. No one's gonna get that other than a host who has a real relationship with the player, okay? Some hosts have that skill, others, not so much. You have to make sure that your hosts are in a situation where they can be proactive, be building relationships. When I say proactive, right, so what I've seen, again, I'm more of an analytics guy, I'm upstairs a lot, but I see a lot of hosts where the, the position restricts them, right? They spend their whole day reacting to customer complaints, comp requests, uh, people who just wanna, you know, gab with them for a while, you know, they think they're their buddy or something like that. They stand at a podium waiting for people to come to them with a situation, right? If that is the definition of the job of a host at your casino, that makes it really tough for the player, for that host to get out there and like meet players that he hasn't already met, he or she hasn't already met. Um, because again, they're like react, they're waiting for people to come to them with an issue as opposed to like going out and like prospecting and meeting new people and all that stuff. So you really gotta look internally and say, you know, are we giving our host the best opportunity to succeed? Um, once they have a relationship, they can hopefully try to sort of work in there and understand the reasoning behind the player's decline. And again, it's a wide range, many of which are completely out of our control, but in those situations where it is in our control, when it's a service issue, when it's maybe a marketing issue, hey, you know, they just give me more free play over there, so, um, then, you know, the host can bring it back by crafting a marketing package that's individual to that player, right? So point number four, right? Um, once you've gained some insight, once the player has told you, maybe not directly, but indirectly, again, reading between the lines a little bit, once they've told you the reason for their decline in play, if it's marketing related, then you want to build around that. You want to build a customized um, marketing plan, right? And you might say, well, you can't build a marketing plan for every player individually, and that's true. All your mass market, medium to low end, less than high frequency players, you know, your offer matrix, or no doubt, you've sort of optimized all those um, segments already, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of players. Again, kind of the point is, going back to the beginning, is this is a pretty small group of players. When you multiply all your hosts times the number of relationships, you actually can, or you should at least attempt to be building individual relationships with all of them and creating marketing plans that work individually. You gotta be willing to um, go a little bit beyond your comfort zone or standards that you set, right? If you have um, 
a rule at your casino. You know, our, our casino reinvestment rate, our target is going to be 18%, whatever it might be. If you find a player is not responding to your marketing, you have to be willing to go a little bit beyond that. Again, not for your mass market players, but for these VIP players, right? High, high dollar purchases, like a car or a house, get negotiated, right? I'm not saying you should sit there and negotiate your marketing offer, but you can't sit there with a fixed price and say take it or leave it, right? I think Saturn tried that and they're out of business. You have to be willing to push the envelope a little bit, raise what you're willing. If a, if a player is generating $1,000 in Theo per month and you have to reinvest at 25 instead of 20% or 30%, right? That's still very profitable and it's worth it. Um, if they, you know, you have certain standards in F and B, you know, we only comp, um, you know, certain bottles of wine up to this limit, right? All right, maybe make an exception here or there. You don't have to um, advertise to the whole world so you don't have everybody else coming up with the same thing. But again, you can sort of set exceptions for individual people. It all goes back to the host having the relationship. It goes back to finding those players in the first place. Right? And the last point is just to keep at it. Like I said, there's no magic bullets. Everything in the casino world takes patience, dedication, but it's like a skill, right? The more that you work at it, the better you're gonna get as a team. You're gonna get some successes. You're gonna see those results in your bottom line. It's gonna encourage you to keep going. And like I said, you're gonna get better at it. You're gonna be able to build those relationships. You're gonna be able to win some of those players back. All right? One, two, three, four, five. And then there's the zero, which would be to predict and to prevent before the player starts to climb. So again, this goes back to relationship building. Some of this goes back to analytics, right? Predictive analytics, being able to tell you ahead of time what players are like right on the cusp and ready to fall, that's not there yet but people are working on stuff like that. People are actually getting, getting close. So it's very interesting. But you shouldn't have to rely just on analytics, right? Again, it's relationship building. The more you know your players. But if you are able to do that, you can skip one through five, right? Because the player's not declining in the first place and you're maintaining that loyalty. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying, like in two sentences, X and declining VIPs are a huge opportunity for revenue growth that don't require any upfront capital investment, right? No one here is saying, oh, but before you get started, you need to spend $100 million and build a new hotel tower, or you need to spend $40 million to a new spot, right? You can start working on this tomorrow. And despite being a large opportunity, it's often overlooked, in my experience. Early intervention, deploying hosts to receptive prospects, personalized marketing plans. Those are the keys to regaining player loyalty and recovering revenue that otherwise would just be lost to the ether. Or worse, to your competitors, right? And nobody wants that. So I wanna say thank you for attending. Thanks for your patience. I really hope you guys will come down uh, during the trade show, visit booth 1012. Uh, feel free to send me an email. And that uh, URL at the bottom is, uh, if you'd like to look at these slides again. Um, and I'm open to any questions, if anyone has any. That URL at the bottom, yeah, this, those slides are there. You won't get to see me, but <laughs> they probably prefer that. But. So you identify the problem, right? Now I'm asking for the free stuff. What <laughs> strategies are you deploying to reverse the problem? Well, I mean, I, that's, you know, the that's points right. one through five. I mean, that's, that's the key, you know? And again, is that the only answer? Of course not. No, is there a program, is there a process that you use, you're data-driven by, you pull the lever, you see the data? Our expertise is in step one and two, which is finding and observing the players. Right? We have database processes. Okay. We, 
we help you identify the players, right? We're, we can, again, your hosts and your employees who are the ones who have to build a relationship. You identify the dots. Come down to booth 1012 and I'll show you all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Okay, what are some of the more creative marketing tactics you've seen deployed for retention? Yeah, well, one thing that I think is interesting is, so at a casino that I worked at, every time they did an external off-site event, and they did quite a few, they started with sort of their top of their database based on, in most cases, average daily Theo, and they started calling those players and asked if you wanted to go. You want tickets to see this concert or this sporting event? So every time they just did the same thing, right? So like the top 50 people in their database got called just about every single time. And then, you know, then they ran out of tickets, so player 51, you know, no more phone calls. So here you have, you know, some really pretty high-end players who just had a few players who were above them, and the, and the casino just did the same thing over and over again. I felt, I guess that's the opposite of what you're asking, but I felt that was a little um, misguided. So, you know, once you spread out, and again, try to offer tickets and things like that to, to a wider group, that obviously is a big help. I mean, everyone loves getting tickets to go see a free concert and stuff, so people who weren't getting any calls started to, you know, get some and be able to attend some of these events. And the, the best thing about the events is that, you know, you have some representatives from your casino there. So they meet some people that they don't normally meet. Sometimes your executive team, uh, a member or two. So it's like, you know, you're at a fun event and stuff, but you get to do a little socializing with like the casino execs as well. And the players appreciate that. So you usually can sound off a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, you had a question as well? Well, no, I mean, on the same lines, I was, um, I was, uh, was going to answer the young lady's question back there. We had the same problem for a very long time where, I, where we're at. <laughs> and what I started to do was I started to eliminate the, uh, the mail invitations to our VIPs. And what I did was I give a, uh, a, the, the list to the host, and they call to invite. Right. But then the problem we ran into, like you said, is they're calling the biggest players first, they fill up the event, right. the rest are not being invited. Right. Right. And how do you approach that? So what I did was I told each host, put 10 to 15% of your quota of tickets that I'm giving you, and make sure you eventually work from the bottom up sometimes, yeah. right. and then for those 10 or 15%, and then scatter those and move it up the line. <coughs> but you're always trying to invite, of course, the top, Ten or right, that of course. List. Right. You don't want them to ever feel that they are, are getting skipped over. But at the same time, you know, you make sure they come to a significant amount, but not necessarily every single event. Not every single right. one, right? Like you said, you want to have some <coughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Our, our property is very limited because we have a small uh, entertainment venue. Okay. So we run into that problem. We only can sit like you know twelve hundred people. So uh, uh, it, it, it fills up fast. You know, you right. say 1,200, but it's not really 1,200. It's 600 VIPs plus sure. their guests. Right, right. So, plus you know, ticket buyers. It, right, it, right. We always run into that problem. That's fascinating. I mean, I just want to go back for a second and say, you know, obviously the size of your property matters. The number of amenities that you have to offer is going to make a difference in what you're able to. But, but um, you want to use each one to the fullest. You know, if you have a golf course, um, you know, you want to invite people to golf tournaments or to get to play. Golf courses are highly un, underutilized. You know, I mean, you can just go online and ask the golf course what their rate is if you want to tee off at 8.30 in the morning or if you want to tee off at 3 in the afternoon. That, you know, anybody can find that out and it's, you know, way less. So that's a great opportunity. Obviously not very many casinos have their own golf course, except around here. But um, you just want to be creative and, and, and try to consider your entire menu set and make sure the players have a chance to experience all of it. All, you know, don't always give a buffet coupon. Make sure they occasionally get the high-end restaurant as well, and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I really appreciate everybody's time, and uh, thanks again. <laughs>